Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today you're in for a new video in which we will discuss five different things that you probably don't know about Errol Flynn. My name is Medium and in this channel I aim to discover more things about classic films which is a subject I absolutely love and hopefully share it with you. So from films we have this image of Errol Flynn being this adventurous, this leading, gorgeous leading man, this swashbuckler, the epitome of a swashbuckler. He created wonderful performances and and many adventure films that are still uh, beautiful to watch at least for me and many of them uh, in collaboration or being uh, besides uh, the lovely and wonderful and very talented Olivia de Havilland and from tabloids audiences at the time got a whole different picture of him what I aim to do with this video is just uncover uh, a few different things or aspects or um, uh, facts that you probably uh, didn't know or that most of the viewers or people who have watched these films don't know about Errol Flynn and that is to give a more uh, broad image of him and also because <laughs> mainly they were uh, amazing for me to discover uh, which I did basically from his autobiography which I uh, also slightly referenced in my previous video and uh, there were so again they were so amazing to discover that I thought I would just make a video focused on that because I think it is amazing it's always lovely to learn something extra from the actors you admire or that you like and that's what I hope you will get from this video so without further ado let's jump into the first thing that you probably don't know about Errol Flynn. So the first one is that his father was a marine biologist and a professor and he began uh, his work in Australia where he was from and he married uh, Errol's mother, Marelle Young and the two went on to board a ship uh, that would go on to an expedition on the South Pole. Uh, she became pregnant or was pregnant during the time and they had to talk this they had to stop in Hobart Tasmania and that's where Errol was born and where they ultimately uh, stayed his father settled then uh, in Tasmania obviously as a biology lecturer at the Harvard University and they stayed there for a while uh, mainly while um, Errol was young. He then went on to become chair of zoology uh, many years later in Northern Ireland in Belfast and he was quite uh, respected as a marine biologist. He went on to several expeditions and discovered new species and uh, from what I read Again, through Errol's autobiography, uh, his father worshipped the work of Charles Darwin and that was something that Errol was exposed to as well. So he was very fond of his father. He was kind of a quiet character compared to the image we all have uh, of Errol. So he was a very tall man, uh, dark hair, kind of like quiet attitude about things and like any professor, any image of any professor that you would have and again he was very fond of his father they went later on uh, to embark together in expeditions which we'll be referencing to later in later things uh, and yes that was the main thing his father was a marine biologist, a professor and had a huge impact on Errol Flynn and they were very close and that's wonderful. Number two, uh, he was part of what I uh, call the original Rat Pack. Uh, we all have in mind the, the Frank Sinatra, Joe Bishop, jo Joey Bishop, uh, Dean Martin, Peter Lawford, Rat Pack. The, that's the the famous uh, group that populated the 60s and 
but there was for me uh, what it was like uh, an earlier version of that uh, which Errol Flynn was part of and they were called the Bundy Drive Boys or the Bundy Drive Gang and the name comes mainly because they would gather at Bundy Drive which is where one of the members uh, an artist and painter named John Decker had his studio and they would gather there and again hence the name for Bundy Drive Boys uh, the group was a um, kind of like a colorful mixture of actors, uh, intellectuals, art collectors, art uh, artists, and um, it had kind of like a different vibe than the Rat the Rat Pack. Uh, so they were kind of like more intellectual, uh, kind of like a highbrow Rat Pack, if you will. And some of the members included John Barrymore, whom Errol Flynn worshipped and would later on and and later on would play his would play him in a in a biography. So there was John Barrymore and John John Barrymore, John Decker, which I previously referred to. Other members would be Thomas Mitchell, uh, writer uh, screen screenwriter Ben Hetch. Um, John Carradine as well and I believe uh, yes and WC Fields as well and I believe that later on there were two more actors who joined or kind of like group occasionally with them uh, would those actors would be Anthony Queen and Vincent Price uh, and the again the vibes would be pretty much gathering for consuming insane amounts of alcohol and I think pulling pranks on each other and probably discussing things and they were they would group during the 30s and the 40s so uh, during that time there were the Rat Pack uh, in Hollywood drinking uh, pulling pranks doing different things and yeah, just being the, the coolest artist interested guys in Hollywood. All right, so number three. Number three is that uh, his biggest aspiration or what he dreamed of becoming was a writer. So uh, I don't know if many of you know about this, but um, Errol Flynn, aside from the autobiography, wrote two other fiction books one called Beam Ends, published in 1937, and another called Showdown, published in 1946. And um, there's a quote in his book and has been referenced in uh, many tweets that I've seen, and it comes up fairly often, that in which Errol Flynn says, By instinct, I'm an adventurer. By choice, I'd like to be a writer. By pure, unadulterated luck, I am an actor. So this quote pretty much sums up what this is all about. He he dreamt or he highly respected the work of a writer. He didn't have as much consideration, unfortunately, for the work of an actor, which was fairly common from what I've seen in other cases for other actors at the time. They didn't regard uh, the profession of being an actor as something serious as writing would be for instance so he very much respected the work of a writer and he aspired to become one and again he published uh, two fiction books which um, take place or are kind of related to the uh, movies he made their adventure book there are adventure books uh, which take place in the sea and there's a um, there's a conflict there's a girl I haven't personally read them I've only uh, researched about them but I will love I would pretty much love to read them and get uh, my own idea about about um, what he he worked on or what he wanted to convey with his books I have uh, as I 
many times mentioned for the last time read his autobiography and even though that book was done also wrote in collaboration with a ghostwriter uh, you can feel or you get the impression that they really are Errol's own words and to be fair the book is really witty it is a pleasure to read it is uncommon the way he is so candid and honest about himself and about the things uh, he did uh, about the, his life the the autobiography covers pretty much his whole life um, and it was a a surprise for me and I developed such a, a respect or interest in Errol Flynn that I didn't have before I loved his films but to be fair uh, he wasn't an actor that I had particularly researched about or been interested about in the past and after reading that book something shifted and he was so honest again um, there were so many different sides about him that I wasn't aware of that I yeah was hooked from that moment on and I really thought that he had a talent for writing and I feel that is indeed a shame that he didn't continue um, that probably he wasn't as consistent as he was in making movies um, but then again we still have some sort of um, proof or books that he wrote so that's that's a good thing we can appreciate that and yes so his his aspiration or his biggest dream was to become a writer he pursued that in a way he became famous as an actor though and um and i w couldn't stress the fact enough that i mean if you if you're interested in every in all this that i'm saying you should definitely go check his autobiography my wicked wicked ways it is um yeah i believe you'll you'll thoroughly enjoy it okay so number four he absolutely loved sailing and he loved the sea which uh it's not uh doesn't come as much of a surprise uh given the fact that his first uh big break as an as an actor was captain blood but he truly he truly truly loved sailing uh, it's something that I've read about him many times he was absolutely mad about the sea if, from a very early age and um, also uh, as I read as I researched his um, relatives from her mother's side were all uh, seafaring folk as he describes them uh, in his book uh, his mother's I think it was grandfather was a sea captain and he also mentions in his book that his mother had a relative who had been involved in the Mountain of the Bounty the original um, event and it's a very uh, I don't know it's it feels kind of like a premonition or so some sort of serendipity that he ended up playing uh, all these characters in the big screen because it, it's just as if he was born to do them because uh, actually uh, his first role uh, ever I believe it wasn't in, in an Aust Australian film and he played the part of Fletcher Christian which was the captain of the bounty so it pretty much feels like um, it was some sort of um, destiny a call from the sea that it was in his blood again captain blood um, it, it's a fascination that he had that absolutely impacted his work uh, in movies which is pretty amazing uh, it was pretty amazing at least for me to discover and um, during his lifetime he owned two boats the at least that i'm aware of um there's one boat i, I believe that his the first boat uh he owned was called sirocco and he got him when he was very young and he would he would go on to um travel around new guinea uh and then 
he had another boat which was called the Zaka, which I believe is his uh, most famous uh, boat. It was a schooner and um, it was also featured in the film The Lady of Shanghai because he loaned the boat to Orson Welles for him to shoot the film and uh, he also uh, made a short documentary uh, Errol Flynn made a short documentary called The Cruise of the Zaka or Cruise of the Zaka uh, which can be found online on YouTube but also uh, originally I found it uh, through the extras of the special um, edition of the DVD of The Adventures of Robin Hood and it, it's a very small film uh, and it could be easily overlooked but I somehow happened to um, take an interest in and I, it was a very enjoyable little film uh, in which he goes on an expedition with his father and artist John Decker as well is in the crew and they go through the Caribbean Sea um, they stop uh, several places and it's a marine biology in collaboration with an institute in California and trying to discover again to gather specimens and discover new species and he just shows you the normal day-to-day -day life of the expedition the way they would uh, um, gather specimens to study them and uh, paint them even uh, and uh, the beautiful places the Caribbean Sea and he truly conveys that passion for the ocean and that style of life of traveling the sea and with the crew and following your passion and going through an adventure so he yes it's a, a, a beautiful film that again I recommend that you watch if you can uh, and uh, you'll get from that absolutely the idea that he was a he loved sailing and uh, his passion, I believe his first passion was the sea above all. To number five, we've made it to number five. Uh, this part I call Adventures in New Guinea is again a part of his life that pre prior to, he, to his uh, Hollywood career and again I'm not sure if many of you would know this but before he even became an actor um, he he had all sorts of adventures especially in New Guinea so the the story goes or as he explains it again in his book that uh, at 18 he was uh, very restless as a young man uh, he had been in various various schools uh, and colleges um, with no success he was expelled I think from a couple which any adventure would be I think <laughs> and uh, he again he became very restless and his main uh, goal was to make his own fortune and he decided to leave his home and embark on this adventure to become rich to gather his fortune and he traveled to New Guinea there were I think prospects in there um, to make your own career he started first by being a district officer there but that didn't last very long um, as you would probably imagine too and he also was an overseer for a while for the copper copra plantation and um, again that that took a part of his life that also didn't work out very well and he also became a gold prospector all again all in a, in the hopes of gathering his own fortune which wasn't getting him anywhere and I believe those were uh, pretty bad ideas in fact to become a uh, bridge uh, but he, in any case he was persistent uh, he pursued and around that time he he bought the Sirocco and he traveled again to Sydney and traveled traveled back to um, to New Guinea and he also uh, worked in a tobacco plantation 
from what I've read. Uh, but ultimately, he became ill with malaria. So that pretty much prevented the whole operation for him to um, acquire his fortune. Um, he never truly recovered from my understanding from the malaria. It kind of developed into a chronic thing. And uh, even though he would seem or he would appear as a very fit man on screen, he had um, issues specifically while shooting Gentleman Jim in action, in action uh, scenes because he would um, get ill. Um, he didn't fully recover from malaria from his uh, times in New Guinea. So yes, he would return to Sydney and he also wrote for the Sydney Bulletin uh, telling stories about his life in New Guinea. And while he was still there, he received a telegram uh, from uh, Australia uh, offering him a part in the film that I I think it was called The Wake of the Bounty that I mentioned earlier and the part was Fletcher Christian um, as I said and they would pay him all the expenses uh, to go uh, there and shoot the film and I believe that was the first well that was the first time he was ever exposed to films and he kind of like saw a silver lining or a route for him to to become uh, to acquire his fortune and that from that uh, moment as they say it is kismet he went on to do the film he would think of pursuing acting in a more uh, consistent manner and I believe that after that he also traveled to the UK and he would do plays there and I also think that that's where he got uh, tested from for Warner Brothers for the part of Captain Blood so it all pretty much stems from these adventures in New Guinea so if he hadn't gone so if he hadn't embarked of all this crazy adventures uh, uh well maybe he wouldn't have become an actor and he we wouldn't have enjoyed his parts in captain blood Air, uh robin hood and other adventure films so uh it was pretty amazing again and awesome to find out to realize that if he hadn't gone through this crazy and kind of like stupid adventures maybe he wouldn't have become an actor uh, so again, it felt um, very much like it was written in the stars for him uh, and it was in any way very uh, surprising, very interesting for me to discover. And yes, that's it. Those are the five things that I wanted to talk about today that you probably didn't know so much about Errol Flynn. So do let me know in the comments down below which was the one that most surprised you or that you enjoyed learning about the most if you didn't already uh, if you have more information or uh, more anecdotes or more things about Errol Flynn also please leave a comment below and explain them uh, so that we can all learn this is a very interesting subject for me and uh, if you like this video give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel uh, I hope to make more videos like this, so any appreciation, any comments will be very much welcome. So I hope you have a really nice week. Uh, thank you for watching and see you again in my next video. Bye!